All right, welcome everyone to this week's second installment to our Rising Tide Foundation double header. Yesterday we were introduced to some big ideas from Femi Krasniki, the creator of the K-19 Great Pyramid documentary. Um, today I'm very overjoyed that Chuck Stevens, who is somebody I've been reading about, I've been following from a distance for a very long time, has agreed to give a presentation that I think will not only complement, but will, uh, I think, bring our, our minds to even greater heights than uh, what was started yesterday, uh, pertaining to the 5,000-year suppression of the dodecahedron. Now, this is something yes. which is nonlinear as a, as a concept, but it's going to make a lot of sense, and it's going to tie in not only a lot of paradoxes pertaining to the sorts of explanations of how things like the ancient pyramid of Giza might have been constructed. How were those people thinking? What did they understand about the nature of the mind, about the nature of the universe, but also how modern science unfolded over the last, you know, several thousand years, including cutting edge discoveries that are yet to be made in atomic physics and beyond. So Chuck is somebody who has uh, co-created the Fusion Energy Foundation. He was a longtime collaborator with Lyndon LaRouche. Um, he was a co-creator of the International Caucus of Labor Committees early on, back in the late 60s way before I was born. And so he's been at the cutting edge of a lot of political, geopolitical, and scientific battles for a very long time. So again, Chuck, thank you so much. And like what we, we usually do is after your main presentation is done, we're going to shift gears and do a Q&A. And I ask everybody who wants to ask a question or share a thought to leave your name in the description box, or not the, the chat box. I will call upon you in queue. Chuck, it is all yours. Okay. I'd like to start with a question. Uh, are people familiar with the Institute for Defense Analysis, IDA, IDA. Every, everyone is unfortunately on mute by default, so you're not going to get too much easy feedback from the live audience. No, no. I, I, all I need is one answer. From I will oh. tell you personally, I am not. And okay, that's all. And it backs up that that negative that negation. Okay. okay. According to Lyndon LaRouche and the original Labor Committee, which led a um, sit-in an occupation of Columbia University in 1968. The Institute for Defense Analysis, which is who they were protesting against by sitting in at Columbia University, the president of the Institute was the president of Columbia University. Um, according to them, uh, the Institute for Defense Analysis was both the nervous system and brain of an organization known as the military industrial complex. And they're still in operation, if you didn't know. Um, IDA uh, also had other tentacles, like Jason, which was the science advisory committee to the Pentagon, still is. Um, amongst the wonderful things that uh, Ida came up with was the electronic wall. They were running the Vietnam War. That's why we were occupying the buildings at Columbia. Um, Ida came up with the electronic wall to stop the Nor North Vietnamese infiltration into South Vietnam. But they came up with other wonderful projects using their scientific uh, insight. One program they had was uh, the introduction of plastic into fragmentation bombs. Now, the idea there was primarily they had studied how the plastic from fragmentation bombs would um, penetrate the, 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 the flesh of children to the right depth. That is, um, they didn't want it to go too far or go through the limb or flesh. They wanted it to embed deep inside the flesh. That meant that the doctors working on the children would have to dig deep into the flesh to find the plastic. The problem is plastic is not seen by x-rays. So therefore they couldn't use x-rays to detect where the fragment of plastic was. And that meant they could only find it by using feel, which meant that they could not use any, um, any uh, amelioration of the pain. Uh, they had to let the children feel all the pain so they would report where the, you know, their fingers getting close to the plastic fragment. And what they, what IDA had realized that this would use up a huge amount of the surgeon's time. That was the idea of the whole plastic in the fragmentation bombs that IDA came up. They came up with 
hundreds of programs like this. They didn't just do this, the children. Um, and so IDA was running the, the military, the, 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 the military industrial complex. They came into existence in 1955 through the joint efforts of I.I. I. Robbie, who was then acting as science advisor to President Eisenhower, and a guy by the name of Bertram Russell. You, you may have heard of him. Uh, Russell and uh, Robbie had been working together going back to at least the 1920s when Robbie and a fellow by the name of J. Robert Oppenheimer had uh, put forward the initiative of Bertram Russell to put forward the new physics, what they call the quantum physics, as, as this was represented by Niels Abel, I mean by Niels um, Bohr, who was also working directly with, with uh, Bertram Russell. So, uh, th this, uh, another organization associated with the uh, IDA was the Congress for Cultural Freedom. They also worked with the CIA. It's one of Lyndon LaRouche's favorite groups. They were primarily interested in getting rid of C-256 and destroying music and things like that. But you can go read what LaRouche has said about the Congress for Cultural Freedom, which again was headed up by J. Robert Oppenheimer and Bertram Russell. Open, completely dedicated to, as what you've gone through in that beautiful um, documentary that you have on H.G. Wells. In fact, I was really surprised. I mean, Wells was the one who first explicitly put forward the goal of reducing world population below one billion. And that apparently is what uh, President Joe Biden is attempting to do right now by initiating a nuclear war, which, as LaRouche pointed out around 2010, 2011, was exactly what was going on <laughs> in terms of the attack on Libya and so forth. In any case, the um, thing is, let us proceed to some of the... Um, some of the illustrations that I have. Um, the first one has, uh, is from the, the, the Dr. Moon's new shell model for the nucleus and shows the icosahedron, shows the octahedron inside the icosahedron. Okay, there we have it. Now, there are, other, there are three other platonic solids in the shell model, but this is the only part of his model that is different than any other such nesting of polyhedra. In fact, uh, a, uh, a machinist by the name of uh, Heyman immediately built a model of the nucleus that Dr. Moon, following Dr. Moon's specifications, and he came in one late night to the office of the Fusion Energy Foundation and said it didn't work. <laughs> that is, he tried to place the octahedron inside the icosahedron according to what uh, Dr. Moon had roughly explained. Dr. Moon has suggested that you take the face of the uh, icosahedron, which is a triangle, and you divide the altitude of that triangle by the golden section, and that gives you the placement for the vertice of the octahedron. Well, it doesn't work. Dr. Moon was wrong about that. So naturally, this uh, led to a bit of a discussion. Dr. Moon was the least bit concerned about that. His model was not based on abstract geometric or algebraic constructions, his model was based on physics, the actual physics of the nucleus. Now, this led me to getting to deep, a deep dive into the whole area of polyhedra. And I, I had the opportunity of working with three leading people in that area. One was Freeman Dyson at the Institute for Advanced Studies at Princeton. He... Um, 
in many ways, he had replaced uh, uh, Bertrand Russell as a sort of chief control. There he is right there. Here I am on, on, on the right there is Zeke Boyd, a founder of the Black Panther Party and also a founder of the Baltimore Labor Committee with me in 1969. In the center there is Freeman Dyson, and he's holding a model that was created by Zeke Boyd. The model is a compound of five octahedra. And uh, as we shall see, that is actually very important. In fact, let's immediately proceed to the uh, uh, Giza pyramid. Yes. This is the largest monument on Earth, stone monument. In fact, you can see it from space. <clears throat> the question is, what is the Giza Pyramid? Now, it, it definitely involves astronomical questions. And um, actually, the issue is how do you how do you create a calendar based on observations in astronomy? This is a question uh, that was a major topic of discussion by Lyndon LaRouche in the 1980s. And in 1984, in the discussion with Lyndon LaRouche, it turns out LaRouche posed a problem to me, which was, how do you resolve the anomaly of the precession of the equinox? This is a, uh, an astro calendar cycle, which is discussed in two books by Tillock, one is called the Orion and the other is called the Arctic Tome. Now, Tillock suggests that the Vedic calendars constructed thousands of years ago, maybe over 20,000 years ago, were that actually resolved this problem of the recession of the equinox. The recession of the equinox is that the North Pole of the Earth actually runs around a circle over 25,600 years. And uh, that is not precise, by the way. None of this stuff is precise. The, the question, though, is what insight does this give you on what is going on in the universe? That is what insight it gives you on neg entropy. And it turns out the solving the problems of the calendar is the process of the maturation of human mentation creative mentation. That's why we were looking at this question. And um, actually, LaRouche, we were involved in discussions with a gentleman by the name of Admiral Hyman Rickover. And LaRouche wrote a memo for Hyman Rickover on this question of calendar construction and how to use this as an educational approach, because we don't know how the first calendars were constructed. So we have children try to replicate the original constructions of those calendars. And in the process, hopefully they would develop the scientific insights that developed out of the construction of these calendars. So LaRouche posed the problem was, what was the first geometrical construction you needed for resolving the issue of the 25,600 year cycle of the precession of the equinox? And um, after spending a day of thinking about it, I came, I guessed, I said the dodecahedron. Now, it turns out I now know how that works. <laughs> I don't, didn't just guess. And the way it works is given to us by the Giza pyramid. That's what the Giza pyramid is. The monument to is the solution to the problem of the recession of the equinox. The solution is given to you by two things. Uh, first of all, yeah, let's move over to the uh, diagram of the Giza pyramid. The third, yes, there it is, okay. We see here the Giza pyramid defining a right triangle. That right triangle, which is the, the height of the pyramid and the midpoint of the edge, giving you the two vertices of the right triangle. That right triangle is a number of different things. First of all, it is explicitly the Kepler triangle which is rather interesting that they have in the Giza pyramid, the triangle which Kepler put forward in, in the 17th century. 
the Kepler triangle. The Kepler triangle is of great interest mathematically because it combines simultaneously the means, the chief means of geometry, the arithmetic mean, the geometrical mean, and the harmonic mean. And according to Kepler, these means, understanding how this harmony works in the solar system, allows one to detect that there is a essential singularity between Mars and Jupiter. That singularity, according to Kepler, was probably an exploded planet. Therefore, in letters to Galileo, Kepler suggested that they go sailing to this point, this exploded planet, and that they may find at this place the cores of planet, of a planet, which makes it very convenient because normally to get to the core, the metals, the diamonds, and so forth, you have to dig miles into the ground. Whereas if the planet is exploded, the core is just sitting there. And since it's in an orbit above that of the Earth's orbit, it's pretty easy to just roll it down the hill, so to speak, to near Earth. This is a project which Kraft Erika was working on all of his life. That is, we want to, in particular, move uh, probably the asteroid titled Psyche 16, which has billions of tons of gold, billions of tons of diamonds, billions of tons of, of, uh, of uh, a titanium and other heavy elements. And um, so if we could move that asteroid, Psyche 16, into an L5 orbit around the moon, that would be very convenient because then we could break off pieces and send them to Earth. Now, a lot of people object to this. Uh, in fact, the objection to this is the same as presented to us by Hans Bethe in 1981. Hans Bethe had a meeting with me and, um, and Captain Edwin Kittner, the, the head of the Magnetic Fusion Program. We had just passed the Magnetic Fusion Engineering Build of 1980, which Carter, for various reasons, had signed, which was a big shock to everybody. And anyway, Beta was explaining to Kittner that he had met with people in London and in Wall Street who told him this would not be permitted because if you develop fusion, you basically make everything infinitely cheap. For example, one gallon of water, any water, has enough heavy hydrogen which is just a few drops of the water, to produce the equivalent of 300 gallons of gasoline. And it costs a couple of pennies to get those heavy hydrogen out of the, the water. And since water is everywhere, um, basically having fusion would mean giving people virtually infinitely cheap energy. And with infinitely cheap energy, you can produce just about anything. You can produce oil if you want to. You can produce any desired minerals and so forth. And um, Beta put it very simply, this is not going to be permitted. This would destroy the world economy. Everything would become irrational if we allow fusion to develop. So they're not going to allow the fusion to develop. This convinced Kittner that he should quit the magnetic fusion program and come join the Fusion Energy Foundation and work with us and Admiral Rickover in implementing LaRouche's other idea, which was the Strategic Defense Initiative, the so-called Star Wars, which is what he did. In fact, that's probably how we got the Star Wars through the Reagan administration was with the help of Admiral Hyman Rickover. Uh, who, now, who is, who is Kittner? Uh, sorry, I'm trying Kittner to... Was, Kittner was the, the chief executive of Hyman Rickover in building the nuclear subs and he was deployed to run the magnetic fusion program in 1985. Thank you. I mean, 1975. He was deployed to run that. And uh, Kittner, in 1981, quit his job as the head of the magnetic fusion program for the Department of Energy and came to New York and would constantly meet with us there and with people down in the Pentagon organizing the so-called SDI, Strategic Defense Initiative. Now, 
Kittner was convinced by Hans Bethe that they were, they were not going to implement the Magnetic Fusion Engineering Act of 1980. So therefore, he went the second best, which, which, which was this. And it turned out that was much more important at the time, because this is how we prevented a nuclear war. There were two scientists working directly, officially, with President Reagan on these things. One was Ray Pollack in the National Security Council, and the second was Gerald Jonas, who was sent from Sandia National Lab. Uh, Jerry had become, in 1975, the official liaison between the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the Fusion Energy Foundation, and uh, we're still in touch. <laughs> it hasn't stopped since 1975. We made, in 1983, we made Jerry the chief scientist and assistant director of the Strategic Defense Initiative under General Abramson uh, in 1983. Um, and he's quite a while aware that we we're the ones who did that. Uh, the, the thing is that these two scientists are not talked about in any of the books on the SDI and what happened and so forth, even though they officially were the only scientists directly in touch with President Reagan, working for President Reagan on the SDI. Now, um, so let's proceed to the, uh, again, to the uh, uh, diagram of the pyramid, uh, the triangle, the right triangle there. Now, it turns out that not only does this right triangle give you the Kepler uh, harmonics that he used to discern the existence of the asteroid belt, the exploded planet, but also it gives you the actual coordinates, unique coordinates for a particular compound of polyhedra. The compound is known as the 20 octahedra. The dual of this is the 20 cubes. Now, the theosophists call this the theosophical solid, by the way, and there are books on that and so forth, but they're not the ones who came. Obviously, <laughs> since the Egyptians actually knew what this was, they gave the, the, the essential coordinate for, for actually developing the actual coordinates for the compound, the 20 octahedra. It also gives you the coordinates for the pentagramma morificum which was later developed originally by um, Napier to explain his 10 laws for spherical trigonometry that allow you to do navigation and also astronomical, astronomical calculations of, of, of the, the orbits of stars and planets. And uh, Gauss wrote this up in some detail while he does not mention the five octahedra, his coordinates that he gives for his, his construction is five octahedra, as it turns out. I was the one, I think, the first to point this out. The five octahedra is very important because, according to Kepler, the compound of five cubes, which is the dual of the five octahedra, is the basis of the creation of the universe. This is something he develops in some detail in Harmonisch's Mundi. And actually, Zeke Boyd is the one who figured this out. And actually, we use that as the core element for the teaching of physical geometry and, um, and uh, so forth for kids. We'd have them build the five cubes as their first construction. We can go through, I have other, by the way, everything I'm developing here is developed in more detail with a lot of scientific papers and references and pictures on my Facebook page. That's, you go to Facebook, Charles we'll, we'll, Stephen. We'll make sure that that's available in the description box and in oh, the yeah. chat box here so people can, can check your work out. Right. So in any case, um, so let me answer questions at this point. You, you, you want to open up for questions? Oh, well, let me say one last thing. I mean, at, at least why. The, you, you might be asking, what's the connection to the dodecahedron? Well, it turns out 
the dual of the 20 octahedra is 20 cubes. And I have a picture of the 20 cubes here. Hold on. Get that. Oh. It's, it's, it's the most complicated one. I, I have I have the 20 octahedra, but also have the 20. Yeah, there's the 20 cubes. Okay. The 20 cubes, because 20 times 8, there are 8 vertices of a cube, and 8 times 20 is 160. So there are 160 vertices in the 20 cube compound. Um. 120 of those vertices are single uh, cube vertexes, six corners of cubes. So, and you find there are 10 such cube corners in, the, in each of the 12 faces of a dodecahedron. The other 40 vertices are double vertices. There are two cube corners, and each of those occur at the vertices of the dodecahedron. So you'll find these double cube vertices define, are given to you by the vertices of the dodecahedron. And that means that the dodecahedron derives from this 20 cube compound which derives is the dual of the 20 octahedra, which is simultaneously the pentagram of Morificum. Now, the way I discovered this was uh, I didn't discover it. it. It turns out that one of the geometers we were working with, David Coxter, had mentioned in an introduction he wrote for Mag Father Magnus Winnerker's book on polyhedra construction, uh, Winnerker was the world's leading constructor of polyhedra. He noted the existence of the, the Gauss pentagram of Morificum, and that fit in with what I was looking for. So I went and I looked that up, and I found that it was five octahedra and so on. Well, one of the geometers working with me, given directed to me by Magnus Winnerker, was a woman by the name of Christine Tuveson. And she pointed out to me that, Chuck, the 20 cube compound and the 20 octahedra compound are the pentagram of Morificum and are, in, in other words, she's the one who pointed, and, and that's Dr. Moon's placement of the octahedron inside the icosahedron. She's the one who pointed these connections out, which once you know it, they're explicit. In other words, it's fairly easy to demonstrate this is the case. So I did not make that discovery. That was Christine Tuveson. And I have this on my Facebook pages, a discussion of that. And I also have a lot of her constructions there on my pages and so forth. Hmm. So, that, so that, that completes the circle there. So I'm ready to answer any questions that people might have. All right, so that, that's quite the thumbnail sketch. <laughs> Check. Yeah. Um, all right, so you, you raised a lot of questions. Um, I, I really do see this as like a, you, you took us for the 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 most approximate uh, whole thumbnail sketch possibly imaginable, and I, I'm thinking you probably want us to be perplexed and to have a ton of questions. So good job on that. I, I guess my question, I'll 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 start the ball rolling. And uh, and see how you respond. And anybody else, feel free to pop your names into the the chat box, and I'll call upon you. The uh, you you originally called this class the five thousand year suppression of the dodecahedron, and you brought up how the dodecahedron construction um, was extremely important for the construction of the well, not only the 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 the, the procession of the equinox calculations, but also the the construction of the the pyramid of Giza. Uh, could you no, say I have no idea how the Pyramid of Giza was constructed. Okay, all right, but the procession of the equinox. <laughs> Why it was that's very important. I do. Okay. Uh, so, so for the uh, procession of the equinox, could you say a little bit more about how you were thinking about this being a sort of master key to help understand how Tilak was thinking about the 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 construction of the, the Vedas that you alluded to uh, as being something that was embedded or or. Uh, 
was tied into an understanding of the perception of the equinox cycle. But how does the how does the the dodecahedron play into any of this? Okay, first of all, it was it was actually Lynn Larouche who came up with the connection to the dodecahedron. And he was he he gave a lot of discussions at conferences and elsewhere about the construction of calendar construction. And I have a paper by him on the connection between Gauss, the Vedic, hymns, and Tillock's work, and the the construction of calendars. Now um, I have a memo by Lynn written for uh, Hyman Rickover on how you would organize classes for grade school students on constructing a calendar and how this leads into these issues of Riemannian geometry and physics. And I can circulate that. Uh, sure. And as Lynn brings up a lot of these questions there. But in any case, the point is um, that Almost all formal approaches to mathematics are false. In fact, uh, actually, we could begin with a much easier sort of problem. One plus one. What does one plus one equal? I feel like it's a trick question, but I'm going to say... No, it's not a trick question. Okay, so Magdalena says two. Who, who's Magdalena? Magdalena is the person who's... Yeah. Oh, who's, oh, oh, yeah, Magdalena. Fingers, okay, fingers yeah. up there, yeah. Oh, okay, now, the, the, the uh, issue was discussed in a dialogue by Plato called the Phaedo. The reason why, according to Socrates, he was executed was he had put forward the notion that maybe one plus one does not equal two. That's why he was executed by the Athenians. So that's who raises the question. It turns out that uh, that our dear friend Bertrand Russell wrote a book with Whitehead called Principia Mathematica. And the first 600 pages of that book is devoted to proving one plus one equals two. According to um, Kurt Gödel, that's wrong that both, um, that it actually um, is, uh, uh, according to Gödel, uh, the construction given by Bertram Russell is uh, incorrect, it's illogical, and it's incomplete. This is still a major issue of discussion today in all areas of mathematics, logic, and philosophy. Is is, is that because two can be the consequence of dividing something, like dividing? One, I don't. I I, I, I refer you one, back. You get to, two. I refer you back to the Phaedo dialogue. In fact, okay, so that's that's I homework for all of us. And thus, yes, for those I need on help YouTube, on this. Okay, so for those listening on YouTube, and also I refer you to to the actual construction given by, um, by uh, Bertram Russell. There's a lot of discussion on, well, you see, when I brought this up on Facebook, Facebook immediately took my posting on this, that is one plus one does not equal two, down saying this was against their community standards. This is where I began to discover there was something there. And I mean, literally, Facebook took down my posting saying it was against their community standards to say one plus one does not equal two. So I began looking into it in some detail. This is when I discovered the uh, Socrates Phaedo dialogue, amongst other things. All right, that, I that, knew something that, about Girdle. Interesting. So you you so as people read the fact, Phaedo, as people read the Phaedo dialogue with Bertrand Russell's approach to his proof in mind, you want them to also think about what Girdle was doing as well, Kurt Girdle, with the same same sort of question? Oh, yes. Okay. Yes. I mean, and, and, and in fact, I would recommend that very strongly because otherwise you, you're, you're, you're lost in hell, so to speak. Interesting. Because Girdle is one of the few people to find a way 
to cut through all of this crap. Do you have a writing by Girdle that you would recommend people look at to help them understand how Girdle's thinking? No, no. Okay. I, I mean, other than go look at Girdle's papers. Th there are writings that would be very helpful, but are not available yet. Um, Girdle was in the habit of keeping a shorthand record of conversations with people. And one of the people he had the most conversations with was Stanley Tenenbaum, who was my tutor on these matters. And Stanley, um, there are like eight volumes of Girdle's shorthand of the discussions with Stanley Tenenbaum that exist at Princeton University that have not been transcribed or published yet. I would uh, strongly recommend we have a political movement to get those volumes transcribed and published. Fascinating. If you want help on this issue. Okay, that's quite the challenge yeah. you're throwing out there. Okay, good. Um, now, well, you see, huh? Actually, LaRouche pointed out in 94 that probably it was Stanley who helped me understand this pentagram of Morificum, and he did actually. In 1989, Dr. Moon was killed. He was my scientific mentor. In fact, I should have mentioned this at the very beginning. There was a paper recently published by about 100 scientists or 200 scientists on the successful uh, generation of gain in inertial fusion experiments in the uh, laser facility at Livermore, the NIF. And in that paper, for the first time in history, they mentioned who initiated fusion research. And the person who initiated fusion research was William Draper Harkins in 1915. Now, that had been suppressed for the last 100 years. The people who suppressed that were primarily around H.G. Wells and, uh, and Bertram Russell. And... Uh, Dr. Moon, who, well, it turns out, if you go to the physics trees, you'll find that my mentor, scientifically, is given as Dr. Robert James Moon from the University of Chicago. And Dr. Moon is given as the, as his mentor is being uh, William Draper Harkins at the University of Chicago. So what happened was, in 1989, for various reasons, because Dr. Moon and I were working with the National Security Council and we successfully uh, brought down the Berlin Wall. Uh, he was killed in 1989. At that point, I asked Stanley Tenenbaum to come help me, and he did for four years. And after working with me for a couple of years is when I discovered the pentagram of Morificum from Gauss, and uh, we had to make a number of discoveries in the polyhedra and in other areas, as noted by Lynn. I'm, I'm exploding with questions, but I'm going to withhold for the time being because people have been waiting. Uh, Kelly, you sure you have a, a question you'd like to throw out there? Uh, I, I think so. Uh, I, I'm, I'm overwhelmed. Uh, like you're throwing all these things at us right now. Um, uh, Poly, polygons and uh, uh, the universe, the pyramids, the um, Vedic, Vedic uh, hymns. Um, calendars. Calendars, okay. Uh, like all this is connected somehow. It, it makes me think like, what, what is this universe that, that we're really in? What, like, like it's almost like the, what we see on the universe is that's not what we see, or that's not what it is. And ah, and what very is good. This, what is this pyramid thing? You know, like what is okay. the pyramid? Well, well for, first of all, what you brought up is not what we see. And it turns out that the, one of the top hobby horses of Lyndon LaRouche was a continuous attack on sensuous perception as having anything to do with reality. By the way, the the um, fake book. And, and, and Google and so forth have taken down all of LaRouche's references to, um, or most of his references to 
uh, uh, sensuous reception as being wrong. This is like in reference to Plato's cave. You've probably heard of that. Yeah. Metaphor. Anyway, the um, but the other thing is is that um, is that Carl Gauss demonstrated in his paper on uh, biquadratic residues. He demonstrated that basically most of what's taught in mathematics and so forth is a systematic brainwashing. That is, the whole notions that people have embedded in them by the time they're out of grade school or out of kindergarten even, of what is right-handed, what is left-handed, what's up or what's down, what's in or out, is the product of brainwashing. And has nothing to do with reality. Now, now um, the, uh, the thing is, he uh, takes um, as his point of attack a fellow by the name of Immanuel Kant. And shows that Kant was unable to deal with this problem of what's referred to as, um, as uh, incongruent counterparts. That's how you left and right. But this was a direct attack on Leibniz, by the way. This is what Kant does, is he attacks Leibniz. But in all of his attacks in Leibniz, he lies. He says one thing one day, he says another thing the next day. That's what Gauss points out. But basically, people aren't allowed to talk about Gauss's comments on, um, on this question of incongruent counterparts in Kant. They're not allowed to talk about it. They just ignore it. Like, for example, I recently discovered in order to avoid these fundamental issues involved with the Giza pyramid and the uh, pentagram and merificum, they've just banned all discussion of the compound of 20 octahedra. <laughs> they just eliminated them from the scientific papers. It's amazing. It's like we're, we're, it's like saying one day we're, we're not going to discuss um, pi anymore. Instead, we're going to replace pi with twenty-two over seven. I think there actually was a law written to that extent in Indiana at one point. We replace pi with twenty-two over seven. Actually, that's how I see pi as twenty-two over seven. That's what I was taught. In oh, yeah, oh, okay, yeah, that's fine. But it's not true. <laughs> and, no, and I knew turns that. Out Nicholas of is the one who figured this out, and LaRouche develops that in quite a bit of detail, which is very similar to the issues brought up by Socrates on the question of one plus one does not equal two. Huh. Fascinating. Uh, Richard, you, uh, you have a question still? Um, yeah, well, two questions. <clears throat> When you say Socrates said one plus one doesn't equal two, I'd like to know where he said that. That's one question. I just gave you the detail. The, Phaedo, the Phaedo is a, is a dialogue so written by there? Plato. Okay. Hmm? The other one is at the beginning of your talk, you talked about the structure of the nucleus. Yes. But then you didn't talk about it anymore. Are you saying the du duodecahedron has something to do with the structure of the nucleus? No, this is Dr. Moon. Dr. Moon worked both with Eugene Wigner and Gephardt Mayer, who were the two people who got the Nobel Prize for the first shell model of the nucleus. He worked with them at the University of Chicago. In fact, I talked to Eugene Wigner about Moon's new shell model of the nucleus. Now, we have a number of articles on this by Larry Hecht and myself in 21st century on Moon's model of the nucleus. Okay. There is a, a researcher in Japan, his name is Cook, who had already begun to do work on using polyhedral models to, to, to analyze the structure of the nucleus, and a lot of work on that has to be done. But he okay. lays out a pretty rigorous pathway. The last thing I'd say is, that is suggest you take a look at the structured atom model. What's okay. that? Edo Kale. Hmm? 
Ido Kale. He has something called the structured atom model. Struct, you know. I haven't seen that. No. And it, 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 it and in fact, in his oh, work, I mean, but send it to me. I, yeah, what? I'll, I'll, I'll send you a, a link to the. Actually, I, I did a review of of that model. Um, I sent you a copy of my uh, Science and Shackled book. And if you go to one of the appendices at the very end, you'll find a little review and introduction to the model that's being referred to. But yeah, it does. It, it is harmonic with the line of thinking of of Doctor Moon. And similarly, for those listening, I included a link just now to the chat box of an introduction to Dr. Moon's work, so people could check that out if they'd like to yeah. after this is finished. Um, yeah, let me just mention a thing about that. Dr. Moon is the person who built the Chicago pile, the first nuclear reactor. He then went on to, to build, help build and run the nuclear reactors at Hanford. And um, he and one of, of Harkin's chief collaborators, a fellow by the name of... Uh, um, Gilbert uh, Lewis, Gilbert G. N. Lewis, had uh, actually responsible for the development of the cyclotron. In fact, it was Lewis who who convinced Harkins to build a cyclotron in Chicago, which Dr. Moon built. I came into this because my father helped build that Chicago cyclotron, and he had recommended hooking up with the people who built the Chicago cyclotron to research fusion research. And that's how I got started. And uh, eventually I ran into Dr. Moon with Lyndon LaRouche. And um, he turned out to be much more than I had hoped for because he was working on the fact that the Gauss electrodynamics was correct, whereas Maxwell is wrong. Now I have a lot of stuff. That's rather a current issue, by the way, because um, in all likelihood, the United States is going to launch a first strike against Russia with its uh, submarine launch missiles. We did a documentary on this called Unsurvivable with LaRouche narration by LaRouche and others, which I recommend watching because it appears that's exactly what our friend um, uh, Joe Biden is in the process of doing right now is moving to a first strike against Russia. It turns out, in all likelihood, that would be very nice because actually the Russians have actually listened to us and done very advanced work on electrodynamics beyond anything Maxwell has and probably would be able to neutralize the electronics of all the incoming warheads. Um, that is advanced electromagnetic pulse technology. Now, we're a little well informed in this area because the guys who did the chief tests on electromagnetic pulse at the Nevada test site, a fellow by the name of Gary Higgins, who was a top collaborator of Edward Teller, he ran a program that was larger than the total budgets of Los Alamos and Livermore on underground tests, tests directed towards understanding electromagnetic pulse and so forth. And the fact is, that they have a fundamental flaw in all of their work in that they believe Maxwell's equations is being correct. It turns out Maxwell is wrong. And in a series of seminars with Harold Grad at the Cron Institute, LaRouche elicited a proof from Harold Grad that the Maxwell equations are no good. And Grad was the, the top student of Richard Courant who was the top student of David Hilbert. I mean, he, he was at the very top of the list in terms of magneto. In fact, the first equation you learn in plasma physics is called the grad shafanov equation, developed by Grad in the U.S. and Shafanov in the Soviet Union on the H-bomb program and so forth. And um, so, and I, I have on my Facebook page the paper reference to the paper by Grad that demonstrates that the Maxwell equations don't work. Now, what that means is that it's possible to penetrate the so-called shields that you put up around your electronics and neutralize all the electronics with a special type of electromagnetic pulse form. And um, the fact that we were in a position to make these sort of judgments is, co is, 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 is corroborated by the fact that the Japanese who are at the forefront of this problem because of their 
being so close to North Korea. Um, they reference us as being the leading experts on electromagnetic pulse. Now, it turns out that's true, not in the sense that we had access to the classified data, but we had access to the scientists with the best overview of that data, namely Gary Higgins and a fellow by the name of Fred Tappert, and it's not so much that they would tell us classified information, they would give us the gestalts of the scientific basis from which they're working. And on that basis, it appears that the Russians are quite capable of neutralizing all the incoming warheads, all the electronics. So that would be the greatest thing in the world. We launch all our missiles, all our warheads against Russia, and they neutralize them all, or 99.9% .9 of them which means that they're sitting there with all their warheads ready to go. And we've shot our wad and can't do anything else. Now, uh, that wouldn't necessarily be such a bad thing. I don't think the Russians are very bloodthirsty. So you don't think that the uh, the Russians have the same sort of contamination or belief in Maxwell's uh, garbage? No, garbage they don't. Than we do. Okay, no, that's, they don't. That's interesting. To, to... That's well known, uh, I, but they, the fact is we have actual evidence of their, well, for example, Glazyev's comments on LaRouche's 100th anniversary, sure. where he references us. And actually, um, the reason why the Russians said uncle in 1989, um, actually it was 1983, August, Teller had a meeting with Velikov in Riche, Sicily, where Velikov signed a joint agreement on the SDI. And the reason why um, uh, Kurt, uh, why uh, Yuri Andropov told Velikov to sign the agreement, in other words, say, uncle, go along with Reagan's Star Wars, was because we had convinced them that uh, this was, that Reagan was serious. And um, immediately at that point in August 1983 is when Andropov disappears. I think they killed him right then and there. And there was almost nuclear war. And I don't know the details of what happened after that. All I know is that Jerry Yonis, who was the chief scientist and assistant director of the SDI, wrote a biography called Death Rays and Delusions, where he details how how um, Gorbachev moved to a first strike in 1988 and actually deployed a laser to shoot down all our satellites, a laser designed by Nikolai Baslov, who I knew quite well. Uh, in fact, he invited me to Moscow in 1978. And in 1981, he came to the U.S. to debate me about the uh, SDI, that we shouldn't do it. But in any case... Uh, no one talks about Jonas's book. There are no citations to Jonas's book, Death Rays and Delusions, which is amazing. I mean, here he is, officially the chief scientist of the Star Wars, the assistant director of Star Wars, and he writes a detailed biography where he details how in 1988, Gorbachev actually moved to a first strike. And there's no comments about it, no discussion of it, which is an interesting response. I mean... In certain, what well, you got to understand, in certain areas, the oligarchy does go bird shit wild. For example, maybe you aren't aware of this, but for three centuries, there was no evidence that Jesus Christ was ever executed. In fact, the Romans killed everybody in Judea in 71 AD. And then, and then another 60 years later, they went back and they killed him again, killed everyone in Judea. No one talks about that. That's, that's a holocaust, if there ever was a holocaust. No one ever talks about this. In fact, they were able to totally suppress the existence of Jesus Christ for almost 300 years. It was amazing. And the fact no one talks about that either. The guy who covers a lot of this um, most thoroughly is uh, is um, the uh, theoretician of the Social Democratic Party, um, 
I'll think of his name in a second. Uh, I'm just blocking one. But is um, well, his history of Christianity. But I'll come back to that. I have that on my 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 Facebook page. The LaRouche wrote a lot of articles by by the way about this about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Who did it and why? For example, the guy who directed the crucifixion of Jesus Christ was none other than Emperor Tiberius, who's waiting on the island of Capri for word that that the deed had been done. His nephew-in-law is the one who was sent there, Pontius Pilate, to carry it out. This is not talked about by anybody in the books. So there's a lot there. I mean, the, 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 the <laughs> this is the way they treated LaRouche. Totally black out everything, even today. Yeah, and the, the fact that he, Tiberius was a an initiate into the cult of Mithra as well, which was revived by the theosophists and, or at least. Oh yeah. 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 No, no. That you weave that into your discussion that, that the theosophists themselves have been doing some actual work on this and not, I guess not every theosophist understands necessarily what the game is, but you're you're mentioned the, uh, the theosophical solid that's um, tied to the, the platonic or the, the Keplerian triangle. And um, and also the pentagram. Oh, no, they the don't make the connection to the Keplerian. They no, don't they make do the that. connection to, okay. to the Keplerian triangle. They stay away. The Theosophists stay far away from 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 Kepler. <laughs> they don't okay. like Kepler. All right, you you have to send the, um, to, to, you have to to give a the, class on that at some point. That's that's fascinating. Um, all right, yeah. I, I have a, I have a question on Zillard and Moon, but I'm gonna I'm gonna withhold that for now. Um. Ah, you know, no, that's a good question. No, no, yeah, okay. no, no, I know Zillard is given credit for you mean you're talking about Dr. The, first, uh, the first particle accelerator, but you were saying that Dr. Moon is actually the one spearheading the first uh, cyclotron, which is the particle cel- accelerator back in the in the day. Uh, why is Zillard well, credit no, for what's no, that story the, about? The cyclotron was done by Lawrence okay. at Berkeley, but the guy behind Lawrence was uh, uh, Gilbert N. Lewis, G. N. Lewis. He had worked with um, with uh, Harkins in Berlin, underneath Fritz Haber, and he had helped uh, Harkins do the first papers on nuclear fusion. Also, uh, Gilbert's work on Einstein is extremely important and is being referenced by um, by uh, uh, Eric Lerner, in terms of because, in other words, what what came together in Berlin to produce the science of fusion was Einstein's work, together with Fritz Haber, together with um, Max Planck. In fact, Max Planck is the one who designed the H bomb. <laughs> it's called a whole rom. And for the Leo Zillard question? Yeah. Um, well, Zillard, and see this, in fact, Lynn had long discussions with Moon about this. Moon had been fooled by Szilard. Szilard had fooled people into thinking the Germans were moving ahead with an atom bomb. And that he was able to initiate this whole program of the Manhattan program, which was, which was absolutely wrong. In other words, the real issue there is that, first of all, the bomb should have never been dropped on Hiroshima and, and Nagasaki. That's even almost as bad a crime as the Holocaust, because the idea of the bomb, as pushed by Churchill, the British, and by J. Robert Oppenheimer and Zillard, was to, to demonstrate to the third world countries that will incinerate you if you don't follow our orders. The whole idea of H.G. Wells, of a world government based on nuclear weapons. That's what the Manhattan Project was, explicitly. And um, the thing is, what broke that down was Teller's push of the hydrogen bomb, which broke the whole thing wide open. That saved the world, actually, in many, many respects. And the Russians view it as to save them. In other words, the original idea as put forward by 
Bertram Russell in his 1946 paper in the Bulletin of Atomic Sciences, who, by the way, the editor of that issue was Dr. Moon, was that we should use our nuclear weapons to incinerate Russia right away. The problem was they didn't have enough. They needed about 500 bombs. And it took them about five years to get the 500 bombs. During that time, Teller put the H-bomb together. And the argument against the H-bomb was that, one, it would destroy the basis of our, our military superiority with atom bombs. And two, that we were wasting all the nuclear reactors producing tritium instead of producing plutonium for bombs. That was the argument given by the the uh, the uh, Oppenheimer committee against the H bomb in 1950-1949. Now they wanted to go ahead with the with the program of Bertram Russell of immediate a nuclear attack on the Soviet Union, hmm. and it only got and the guy pushing that the only guy pushing that at the time officially in the U.S. government was I. I. Robbie. Wow. So, uh, the, but anyway, I'm bringing up a huge amount of history and science and yeah. so forth. I understand that. Yeah. But. <laughs> no, it's fun. It's 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 a lot, but it's fun. Yeah. Uh, all right. So I got Guy. Uh, Guy has been waiting for a while. Guy guy. Are you still there? Uh, you're on mute if you are still there. Let me just go see. Yeah. Guy Femro. Yay. Guy, we'll circle back to you if you're having trouble with your microphone. So, um, yeah. Oh, there you are. I heard your voice there for a second, but you're back on mute again. So, do that again. Whatever you did, do it again. Guy, yeah, there you go. There we go. Okay, Guy. Okay, Guy, it's all yours. Yeah, I was interested in the term harmonics. What was the. Yes. What do you mean by harmonics? <laughs> <laughs> that is a very good question. Um, the, I, I actually had some very interesting discussions with Carlo Levy Minzi, the pianist on this whole question back in the 80s, and a lot of discussions with, um, with Brian Ean, the violinist, and so forth. The... The problem is that you can you can't, in a certain sense, measure harmonics except by a resonance. In nineteen and in eighteen twenty eight, Wilhelm Weber, at the conference founding German science in Berlin, uh, it was organized by the by Alexander Humboldt with um, Gauss in, in, in attendance. Um, he recommended that we campaign for a well-tempered scale centered on C256, a Bach well-tempered scale centered at C256. That is extremely controversial. What, what, what Weber, Wilhelm Weber did was he actually built an instrument which for the first time could begin to measure frequencies in the schoolroom. And he recommended they were trying to put these instruments in all the gymnasiums in Germany. But fundamentally, the only way you can measure a resonance, that is to measure actual frequencies and so forth, is by actually singing, by actually playing. That, that in reality, what the instrument is doing is infinitely more complex than any mathematical formulation that you can put together. The fact is, actually, I, my friend um, Winston Bostick actually wrote a paper on this. Bostick demonstrated that with a coherent wave in a whip, you can produce million electron beam uh, particles, million electron 
particles off the tip of a of a, 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 a of, of, of a, a whip. And this is actually what's going on when you when you use a bow to attack the string on a string instrument. So that the the level of coherence that you can reach with that is infinitely beyond any sort of ordinary representation of acoustics and outside the physical range of the way acoustics is normally uh, normally looked at. One example of this, a rather sort of uh, crucial example of this, is a thing called sonoluminescence. The, this is where acoustic waves are used to compress bubbles and they produce bursts of light. Now we wrote a lot about this in 21st century science, but this was informed by Stanley Tenenbaum, who was asked by LaRouche of what was the connection between high temperature superconductivity and cold fusion. And he came up with the answer, sonoluminescence. The first question is, where is the light term in the Navier-Stokes equation? Because there ain't no light term in the Navier-Stokes equation. And Navier-Stokes is sort of the fundamental equation for hydrodynamics. And the, the, the issue is that's the same problem you have on this question of resonance and harmonics, that you're dealing with virtually transfinite type of quantities. LaRouche believed that the golden section was a as developed by the pentagrammaterificum, was a non-numerical quantity that represented a certain level of harmonics in the living processes and in terms of fundamental physics. And the example of this is the book by Luca Pacioli called The Divine Proportion, and the work by Leonardo da Vinci demonstrating that you cannot distinguish between living and non-living processes without reference to the golden section as a transfinite or non-numeric quantity. That's the issue there. Amazing. <laughs> Piece of cake. <laughs> what? I said, piece of cake. Piece of cake, yes. When you say it like that, it all sounds so easy. <laughs> no, that, that's that's great, man. That's really great. Um, again, uh, so let's get back to the, the questioners in, in line here. I got Mike. Mike, you still there? There you are. Yeah, I'm here, but my question ended up coming after more information, so we should really let Monty hit it first, and then I'll follow up because I'm really resonating with the frequency dynamic that Mr. Stevens just proposed. <laughs> right, Monty? Yes, so uh, yes, yeah, my understanding that Russians are like a generation ahead of us right now, just in so far as uh hypersonic missiles they've deployed three of them and also their uh their inter interceptor uh technology for intercepting uh electromagnetic wave is way ahead of us also but uh just a quick question uh on on basically the sabotage of the strategic defense initiative uh there there seemed to be a thing with the american physical society somewhere in a time frame in 1987 and a u.s oh yeah jet they said it was unfeasible. They had to go to a kinetic oh, yeah. energy, a brilliant pebbles program to dumb it all down because yeah. they, they was that a cover up of the advanced physics that were absent that we were on the verge of a breakthrough or uh, what was some of well, no, it, it, I mean, the real issue was that we had gotten through to the Russians in 1983 and they had said uncle mainly because. Uh, Velikov had asked us, this was two weeks after Reagan's announcement, March 23rd, 1983. Velikov, Eugenie Velikov, who was sort of, I think he was then vice president of the Soviet Academy of Sciences, but he came president later on and the chief advisor to Gorbachev. Velikov said, okay, 
I want you to prove to me that Reagan is willing to share the technology and that you are the people behind this policy. And it's very simple. All you got to do is get the U.S. to agree to build a tokamak fusion reactor in Moscow. Now, the reasoning there was he wanted to build a fusion reactor. Actually, he was very interested in fusion reactors, Velikov, being a sort of uh, a student of Vernadsky. But anyway, uh, Edward Teller and John uh, Hopkins Knuckles at Ariche, Sicily, did offer to build a tokamak fusion reactor in Moscow. Now, the reason why Velikov had brought that up is, one, we had a treaty for joint work on fusion. So we didn't need a new treaty. That is the new joint work in SDI called for a new treaty. But fusion, we, are, we could immediately do with the existing treaty. Secondly, much of the technology that goes into the SDI is the same technology that goes into a fusion reactor. So we would be immediately sharing that technology with the Russians by building a tokamak fusion reactor in Moscow. That's why uh, uh, when Velikov called up Andropov from Mariche, Andropov said, yes, okay, they agree, go. And that's the minute that the airliner was shot down and then that uh, Andropov disappears, we don't hear from him again, and everything goes kablooey. Um, the, uh, so we had won. That's how we won. LaRouche had won. We put through the policy. The policy had worked, and the Russians went crazy for a while. Um, also, I mean, the, the way in which the SDI was sabotaged was very direct. Uh, you may have heard the Challenger was blown up. Remember the space shuttle Challenger? Mm -hmm. Well, one month before the Challenger blew up, I yelled at Jerry Jonas that George Keyworth was in the process of blowing up the space shuttle, the space shuttle Challenger. I said, Keyworth is blowing it up. That was in Las Vegas in December 1984. And uh, a month later, I was in Jerry's office when the shuttle blew up. He was with Abramson, who had been in charge of the shuttle. That destroyed the U in formal terms, that destroyed the US SDI program because we had no way to put anything into orbit with the shuttle blown up. Now, how did they blow the shuttle up? Well, we've had that in great detail in EIR. The first stage was they got rid of Rickover in 82. They accused Rickover of taking bribes from General Dynamics. The same people were used a year later to get rid of the leadership in NASA on the same charge that they were taking bribes from General Dynamics. When they got rid of the leadership from NASA, they were able to put this guy Graham in who ordered the shuttle to launch at a temperature below 32 degrees, which meant that the O-rings froze, as Feynman demonstrated in the press conference with the ice water, froze, and that blew up the shuttle. So the shuttle was purposely blown up. In fact, if you really are interested in U.S. national security, your first stage would be to shoot every chief executive in the aerospace defense industry. Shoot them all. <laughs> They're all traitors. I can prove that. The, they were all traitors. And um, that, that, uh, that, that they went along sabotaging the whole U.S. capability. This is why they went after the German scientists. Lynn wrote articles about this at the time, about how Keyworth and these other people were working inside the aerospace defense industry to destroy U.S. capabilities. Uh, you you know you know what won the Cold War, right? Does anyone know what won the Cold War? What stopped the Russians? Why didn't the Russians move into Western Europe? Why would they? Yeah, I I, I had always a, I mean, a naive I, idea that uh, that Gorby was placed in there by a bunch of Esalen Institute operatives to destroy Russia from within. And I didn't really know that there was an, a, an attempt to launch a strike from Russia. I didn't know about that. So this is all new, news to me. So I don't really know. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, just read, read Jonas's book, Death, Rays, and Illusions. Also read all the references to it. There are none. They don't talk about it. I haven't been able to get anybody to talk about it.
at Los Alamos or Livermore. But I'll tell you what stopped the Russians. In 1983, LaRouche and Teller joined together to deploy neutron bombs to the West German Panzer divisions. The guy we worked, we worked with two people on that. One was um, General Albert Scheer. He was a head of the BND and, uh, in Germany. That's the German CIA. And the other one um, was um, uh, from France. We worked with a, uh, a French general who uh, is actually, we had him in EIR and we had a tour of the country. And basically, um, we did deploy the neutron bombs to the West German um, uh, Panzer divisions, and they could have been in Paris within, a, been in Moscow within a week or two, if required. And that convinced the Russians not to go to war. They would lose. As far as I can tell. I mean, I'm not absolutely certain of it, but it's a pretty, pretty good case. And this is not talked about anywhere. No one discusses it at all. We were also working with Harold Agnew, the director of Los Alamos Laboratories, the one who also proposed that we deploy the neutron bombs. The point of the neutron bombs was that it gave a platoon commander in a tank division, a platoon is four tanks, the firepower equivalent of 150,000, 155 millimeter howitzers with no drawback. In other words, they could destroy anything they could see. And, and the Russians couldn't keep up with that. The Russians had great tank commanders on a regimental or division level, but they didn't have great platoon leaders. And it turned out the German army was filled with good platoon leaders, especially coming out of the Second World War. So the thing was, as far as I understand it, it was the deployment of neutron bombs that actually gave us a military war-winning capability, and the Russians decided that they wouldn't test it. I'm curious to explore more of the evidence of Russia's attempt to launch a strike in the in the 80s. Um, is it yeah. only Tunis's book, or is, are there other ways to look at this? Because I don't know any... No, no. First go to his book, because he talks about specific okay. programs. There was a Polyus R. All right. There was a launch of this large booster by the Russians okay. that apparently failed. In other words, they, and and there's some discussion of that, but I, I haven't been able to tease out. Mm. I mean, I've talked to people about this. They refuse to actually discuss it okay, and so forth. But the fact that, that, that there's no references to it, it tells you right away there's a lot there. Yeah, it's not allowed. And, to be and also, I think I think what you've said about uh, Andropov's disappearance being connected to his giving the green light to cooperate on the SDI is is a huge. I'm just saying it's a coincidence. Yeah, it's a coincidence. In, it's not not causation, this, but it's it's damn interesting. Damn interesting. Yes, um, I, I I mean I know about the talk because I was at Livermore. Yeah. When Teller and and John Knuckles, and I've only recently talked to John Knuckles about his experience at at, at, at Riche. I'm still in touch with John. He's the former director of Lawrence, uh, of Lawrence Livermore Laboratory. Also, John is was the inspiration for the development of the Fusion Energy Foundation in 1973, and I came in touch with him in 1975, and have still been. I'm still in touch with him. I mean, he's about 95 years old, but he's still kicking. Hmm. And uh, the uh, same thing with Gerald Jonas. Uh, but the point was that um, that that he, that the Russians did launch this large booster, Polyus R, which some people talk about carrying a carbon dioxide laser, which is what we discussed in the paper we did uh, on beam weapons, Sputnik of the 70s. We discussed uh, uh, Basol's construction of a CO2 laser for missile defense, but this was not missile defense. They were using it for to take out all the satellites as a first strike, as part of a first strike, which makes a lot of sense. And um, so the, 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 but the fact is uh, their general response to us on everything 
1986, they sent 500 paramilitary into Leesburg here to kill us. Mm -hmm. We, The Fusion Energy Foundation was in the process of building a fusion reactor. Yeah. We had the resources and the people to do it. And we were going to do it. Well, they sent 500 paramilitary in to prevent that. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And they did. They did prevent it. It scared a lot of people, too. Mm -hmm. And um, the uh, the uh, thing is that, uh, and it's still there. I mean, the, 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 I, it's really amazing. I mean, the, recently they mobilized um, uh, Kevin Zondervan's back. He's talking about fusion. I, I don't know why they're talking to him about fusion, but he was one of the guys I work most closely with from the Air Force uh, in terms of the SDI and so forth. So it's, it's, there's all hell is breaking loose right now. Basically, that's what's going on. All hell is breaking loose as it should. Yeah. Right. I don't know everything that's going on. I just know tidbits here and there. Maybe we put some things together and so forth. It may sound astoundingly insightful, but it's very limited in reality. Well, you're 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 triangulating well. That's good. Um, all right, so we got here. Um, Mike Richard has a follow up, and then Jerry on antimatter. So, um, Mike, do you want to ask your question now? Yeah. Okay. Copy that. All right. Let's get lower my hand here. All right, Mr. Stevens, you clearly demonstrated yes. you're an individual that likes to think in contextual form. So you're trying to bring in a lot of information from exterior circumstances to see if you can map your current situation. So. I actually have three questions, but I'm going to let you go with the first two. And then after okay. the next gentleman, maybe I'll get the chance to follow up with the third. The first one is, okay. in your opinion, given the information and the contextual information that you're bringing to bear, why are you still alive? And who benefits oh. from you being relegated to the dustbin with your particular perspectives? Okay, that's very good questions. First of all, I can't explain it. Uh, um, in, in 1978, I was invited to the Soviet Union by Nikolai Basov. Um, now, the people who sent me, who gave me my instructions upon leaving the U.S., uh, uh, Gus Axios and... Uh, was the primary one at the time. He was, as we later determined, was most likely a KGB agent. So he's giving me my instructions on leaving. And his instructions were to lead, to, move, to meet with the leading KGB representative from the Soviet government, the guy officially in charge of nuclear weapons intelligence. His name was uh, Isaiah. And we had met with him. He was New York resident of the KGB at the United Nations. He was the permanent representative of the IAEA to the United Nations. And we, we have in our newspaper articles and stuff. He was at the founding of the Fusion Energy Foundation. Now, in Moscow, I met with him six times. He even gave me a tour of Lenin Hills. That's where they had the brainwashing facilities and so forth. But anyway, his first question was, what is the U.S. up to in the nuclear weapons? What is the danger to the Soviet Union? And my answer was straight out. Lyndon LaRouche, he's the number one danger. He's organizing the Strategic Defense Initiative, the Star Wars. And I wrote a 44-page report detailing how we were organizing that. Obviously, they didn't believe me at the time. In fact, most people in the U.S. thought it was impossible that we would get this program that we wrote up in the 1977 uh, Sputnik of the 70s report, which I have a, a lot in there, by the way. Um, the, is that you'll never get that implemented. LaRouche's answer was, we only have to need to convince one person, Reagan. And we did. So, okay. So I can't explain why the Russians didn't kill me or brainwash me in Moscow in 1978, how I survived that, or how I survived now. Except I've been working hand in glove 
with a number of networks, namely with the Edward Teller Network at Lawrence Livermore Laboratory is represented by um, John Knuckles and with um, Gerald Jonas, who's at Sandia, who was the chief scientist of the SDI. So I don't know. I don't know. If I were them, I would have killed me a long time ago. How did they diminish you then? How did they diminish you? Since they didn't eliminate ah. you, they feel then that it's okay to have you around. Because the one thing about the oligarchy is that expansion of ideas is very dangerous to them. So it's a high risk. It's a high risk then. I I am totally, I am known as verboten. People aren't allowed to talk to me. It doesn't matter where, what you're doing now is dangerous. Let me tell you. That is... I'm totally kept incommunicado. People I've known for decades won't talk to me. And they won't give me a good reason for why they won't talk to me. But that's all right. That's okay. All I know is a lot of pressures put on them to prevent them from talking with me. Now, my point of view is I certainly do not have the, the patent on truth. In other words, everything I know is, is, is not the absolute truth. A lot of holes, problems, and so forth. But discussion allows you to work out what's the best way to approach these things. That's one of the ways in which they kept me isolated. Because it was important to have the discussions we had back in the 80s and 90s. But those were all cut off by 90. After LaRouche mentioned the pentagram and Morificum, which, by the way, was suppressed. His discussion of that was suppressed. Um, after that, and LaRouche understood this. For example, in 1985, we had a series of major scientific breakthroughs. They consisted of the work of Daniel R. Wells from the University of Miami, Carl Gables, and the work on the Beltrami vortex approach to fusion, and the work more generally on self-organized magnetic plasmas, and then Dr. Moon with his breakthrough on a new new shell model for the nucleus. And two major scientific breakthroughs. And um, the uh, thing is that we've had the systematic suppression of that work. For example, Lynn wrote a beautiful memo about the work of Wells and his deeper scientific implications. And when Wells died, I wanted to publish that as an obituary, and they wouldn't allow it to be published. Now, what happened was, it just so happened that in 1985, when we made this major breakthrough, pioneered by Lynn, on what's called negative curvature, Beltrami negative curvature of space-time, when we made that breakthrough, I began looking at my own personal history, and it turned out that my great-grandfather patented Beltrami negative curvature in 1870 in the United States and in Great Britain. Now, you might say, how can you patent a concept? Well, he patented Beltrami's, what's called the pseudosphere, representation of the hyperbolic plane. He patented this as as a means of doing machining and of also propellers. And he had the patents in in London and in the United States. Now, the thing was, I had no idea of this. I mean, well, I did in a certain sense that this was in the family. We we're all a bunch of machinists and stuff. And I knew we were going downhill. My father's production machinist. His father's tool and die maker. He could do bake anything. And his father is the one who helped found nuclear physics and did the patent on Beltrami negative curvature. <laughs> So it's sort of going downhill. But the thing was, is only in 85 when Lynn made this breakthrough and I brought the patents to Lynn and Lynn's response was, shh, keep quiet. <laughs> Just like to add, so, uh, um, your, your machinist thing, you don't, you don't get mill rights without the machinists doing what they do. Just so you know. Well, that you probably know a lot more about. See, my fundamental basic psychological problem was I didn't listen to my father. In fact, the way that happened, see, originally I wanted to become a priest. 
But then I, I um, ran into a, a group of saints uh, who redirected me. And uh, the one guy in particular who ran an organization called the Brothers of the Christian Schools, which was the largest order in the Catholic Church. After talking to me for two months, he said, your fundamental problem, problem Chuck, is you got to talk to your father. And I said, my father doesn't go to church. Talk to your father. <laughs> that changed everything. For the first time, I talked to my father because I was directed by a saint. Maybe you don't know this. Uh, we work very closely with John Paul II. Yeah, you're aware of that, right? I know that John Paul II has uh, an affinity for kind of being an outside of the box thinker. It costed him. Well, no, no, no. Politically, we work very closely with John Paul II. LaRouche did. LaRouche and Helga. Now, the thing is, what's not so well known is that uh, John Paul II had a hitman. The hitman in his organization was Mother Teresa. Whoa. What? Now, um, all you got to do is read some of the books they've written, attacks on Mother Teresa. I mean, she is the most attacked figure in the 20th century. The British, I mean, one attack after another. Well, she, I talked directly to her <laughs> on several occasions. And uh, it's the only saint I ever, official saint I ever talked to directly. <laughs> and she was definitely the uh, hitman for, for uh, John Paul II. N in other words, these were the, in other words, like Lincoln. I mean, Lincoln's problem was he had to find the right generals. He needed a couple killer generals, and he found them in Grant and Sherman, and they were killers, let me tell you. They, they, they went for the throat, and they won. And I just, just the other day, I found out why Reynolds was not made commander of the Army of the Potomac. What they, what, they, what they interrogated him about was whether he was ready to go the whole distance, because Grant and Sherman had determined after Shiloh they would probably have to depopulate the South and change everything. In other words, they came up with a killer strategy. A no, no, no holds barred strategy is the only way they're going to win. After they went through the Battle of Shiloh, they realized that this was not going to, there was not going to be any sort of reasonable agreement. They were going to have to kill. And indeed, that was the situation of the United States. Most people have no idea who won the, the Civil War. The key group that won the Civil War. The British. People like. Hmm? No, Ramsey Korsakoff. He's one of the people who won the Civil War. The, the Russians. The British and French were ready to recognize the South in 1863. Gettysburg didn't make any difference. Vicksburg didn't make any difference. They had sufficient forces to recognize the South and break the blockade. At that point, Alexander II, working under the direction of a real killer, Marcellus Cassius Clay, whose uh, namesake lived up to everything Cassius Clay did, uh, he, he convinced the Tsar to deploy the, the frigates of the Russian Navy to New York and San Francisco. Those forces were sufficient to destroy the entire merchant fleet of England and France alone. And that's why France and England did not. In fact, that's why, that's why the motion by Palmerston and Russell to support the South failed in the in the in in the meeting of the uh, cabinet in England they put forward a motion to do that so really what won the civil war was the russian navy mm. and you haven't heard that anywhere else and um yeah that's what uh, Eisenhower is going to discuss when he went to Moscow and when he would go to Moscow in 1960. 
And that's why they shot down the U-2 to prevent that trip. Because <laughs> that would have been explosive. Eisenhower discussing how Russia had won the Civil War. In hmm. fact, the truth of the matter is, from the very beginning, the chief ally of the American Revolution was none other than Catherine the Great. Why? Because she was informed by Frederick the Great, don't give a soldier to George III. Cut him off. And she did. She then went on to organize the League of Neutrality, which was way before the French in terms of supporting the revolution. That was Frederick the Great and Catherine the Great. And that's not known or discussed. So our, so our best and closest ally from the very beginning was Russia. It's a beautiful irony. A beautiful irony. <laughs> so, uh, we'll go to, I know Richard's been waiting for a follow-up question, and then we'll go to Jerry and then back to uh, Mike for his follow-up. So, Richard? Thank you. A question and a comment. <clears throat> Question, you talked about the enhanced electromagnetic pulse that the Russians have. Would that be um, longitudinal electronic electrical waves? Yeah, I know what you're talking about there a little bit, but I, I mean, I've not fully delved into that. But the point <clears throat> is more general because we, do, we are not privy to the classified information. Okay. What I would reference to you is, 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 is the... Uh, a series of articles I did in the EIR on bel canto tuning of lasers, something Lynn talked about April 15, 1983. Okay, and other... and um, we did that, okay. that you take Leonardo da Vinci's experiment. You have a soprano who is, I think it's a high C, breaking the wine glass with her high C without moving the candle in front of her face. Mm -hmm. That experiment is banned. They aren't, you're not allowed to talk about that, yeah. but it's an actual experiment. Okay. I, I put a, and, I put a comment in the uh, comment section referencing the Sapphire project. Um, Cause you were, know, talking, I you were talking about self-organizing plasma for uh, yeah. Well, the Sapphire Project is all about that. <clears throat> so, um, I mean, they have... Where was the Sapphire Project? Well, it's a group of people connected with the Electric Universe Project. Oh, oh yeah, that I'm very familiar with. Sapphire? No, it's... the Electric Universe people. Okay, but it's part... They are friends of the Electric Universe Project. Uh, okay, the Sapphire fine. Project, no, no, no. They, they built us. What they call it is like a sun simulator, you know, mm -hmm. and um, by changing the gases and the pressure and the voltages, they get all kinds of phenomena, you know. I'm of, sure they do, yes. Way, way more energy being generated than they're put in and all that. So I thought you should know about that, given what you're talking yes, about. Yes, no, I want to know everything you, you, you can send me on this, but oh, I will make a general. So I, I make couldn't take it all in. <laughs> okay, no, no, I understand. The the um, uh, I am familiar with the Electric Universe people. So far as I know, I mean, I'm still in the process of analyzing it. This is part of the um, of of the Tesla business and the continuation of that. And I think um, uh, Matthew is going to be talking about this a little bit with our friend uh, J.P. Morgan. <laughs> And company, and I think Tony touched on some of this in his discussions on the electricity and so forth. But there, there was a move by a group of people in the labor committee, and um, and these electric universe people to cut off my communications with Tony Parrot at Los Alamos National Lab. Which, which is, you know, it, 
is not fatal. I mean, there's there's no problem there. I mean, Tony is a good guy, and I've been working with him for fifty years. But he he, he was he was uh, uh, he was an assistant secretary of energy for defense programs and running the computers and so forth. And he's doing marvelous work on on these petroglyphs and the measurements and so forth. You should listen to his all his, but. The, the object there was to cut off my communications with these people. And anytime I have people intervening to stop my communication, because, I mean, I'm open. In other words, I'll talk to anybody, anytime. I have no fundamental, um, so to speak, uh, uh, axes to grind. Even if you, even if you, and previously worked with bad people and so forth. That's okay. Because most people have worked with bad people one way or another. The question is, are you open to dialogue and discussion? That's the issue. And these people were not open to dialogue and discussion. They just tried to shut down discussion. Hmm. So I don't know that much about the Electric Universe people directly or their periphery with, with the Sapphire program. I'm interested in all of it. It's all of great interest. But fundamentally, in general, I found everyone is traceable back to Ampere and Gauss, who are doing worthwhile things. That's sort of my touchstone yeah. on this stuff. It's Carl Friedrich Gauss and uh, Marie Ampere. Would you say Weber is also on par with those two, or? Oh yeah, the Weber was was recruited by Humboldt to work with Gauss building the telegraph, and so he walked from Leipzig to Göttingen, and he, he lied to the city fathers of Göttingen, saying that these wires for the telegraph were not fire hazards, but they were. They they would attract lightning, and they were fire hazards. But he lied. And they built the first working telegraph hmm. there in Göttingen for the United States and Russia. He was working both with Russia and the United States, not just one of them. He's the founding father of electrodynamics in in um, Russia and in the United States, and everything is traceable back to that. Hmm. Yeah, we just had a a class not that long ago by uh, Professor Aziz uh, introducing. Oh yes, no work, and that was exciting. What a yeah. Well, no, no, I've been in touch with him for like thirty years, and everything he does is very worthwhile. Hmm. Yep. Jerry, uh, I know you have a question on uh, matter matter antimatter, whatever antimatter is. Yes, how you doing, Chuck? Yeah. Um. Many years ago, actually, very well. Oh, good. Many years ago, you wrote some articles on antimatter that I thought was so interesting, and you also discussed this idea of uh, pair production, which I thought was one of the most fascinating ideas I'd ever heard. And I thought that was so interesting that I actually cut the article out of the paper. And if people can see, oh, wow. I still have it. The Gates <laughs> to the Universe of Antimatter. I think it was a conference you went to in Italy. But my problem yes. is that discussion of antimatter today in the mainstream media, I find is garbage. It, it's almost like cartoon shit. And so when anyone asks me my thoughts on antimatter, I say, I don't believe it exists. It's not. But... I think there, there was some phenomenon there which they gave a name of antimatter and it's become this superhero cartoon crap. But I wanted to know what's your latest thoughts on it. <laughs> if, wow. if we could pick your brain on that. Quite a bit. This, is, this, is, <laughs> this is at the forefront of my, my research. Um, the main thing to read is Eric Baga, B-A-G-G-E. He is the German scientist who uh, 
came closest to building an actual nuclear reactor and part of the German program. And after the war, he did build the first German nuclear reactor that, that powered the ship, the Otto Hahn. Um, Baga had a uh, long series of seminars with us in, in, in Leesburg here with Dr. Moon. And he's the one who uh, uncovered the fact that Dr. Moon was the one who did the Manhattan Project. I didn't know this. He, because he wanted to know how you did it. How did you build this reactor? Because <laughs> he failed. <laughs> he wanted to know how you did it. And one of the main areas they were both interested in was the non-existence of the neutrino. As you know, the neutrino was invented by Wolfgang Pauli. He pulled it out of his pocket in order to balance the books. <laughs> on the energy, because they had this missing energy in pair production. And, and uh, actually, I think Dr. Moon had the most um, success in understanding it. Basically, um, this is the key to understanding everything in the universe, including life. The neutrino does not exist. The neutrino are actually uh, vibrations of what Dr. Moon referred to as a space-time lattice. And this is what he came up with in our seminars in the mid-80s in response to Lynn on the negative curvature business. And basically it's this, that actually every physical action, for example, an electron changing from one orbit to another orbit. Right? In other words, if you do something, you're going to change the orbits of electrons. The time it takes for the electron to move from one orbit to another orbit is instantaneous. It's in the simultaneity of eternity. That's the first problem. The second problem is how you detect this interaction of the electrons with the space-time lattice. And the only way you can do that, so far as we know, is by pair production. That is, for example, the decay of neutrons. In fact, that's one of the experiments we discussed with Edward Teller in 1989, was we wanted to, to have a very large flux of coherent neutrons, which we get from spin-polarized fusion, all the neutrons would be 14 million electron volts. And these would interact with the space-time lattice, allowing us to see directionality in the space-time lattice or even measure vibrations of the space-time lattice, which in turn would tell us what is actually causing the electrons to move from one orbit to another orbit and what's going on in the living processes. So this is is literally at the forefront of what we want to do research-wise. The problem is they, they uh, of course, put LaRouche immediately in prison once we brought down the Berlin Wall and they shut us down and so forth. And there's been all sorts. In other words, everything was done to stop what Teller and I discussed in 88. In fact, that, that was the preliminary. In other words, in 1988, I met with Dr. Teller in Washington. He took me out to dinner at the Cosmos Club. Uh, the thing, and this is what we talked about, and everything we discussed was well recorded by the uh, authorities because a afterwards, uh, Jerry Yonis told me the wine that we drank at the dinner. <laughs> I mean, talk with Jerry, my direct contact is the Joint Chiefs of Staff. In any case, I was sent to Europe to be corrected by Lynn because I was at that time jumping up and down about the electrodynamics. And upon arriving in Europe, Lynn did not meet with me. Instead, Lynn sent, instead of correcting me, Lynn sent me on a European-wide tour to present my views. Hmm. And my views had been informed by what Lynn had said in Berlin a few weeks before, that the wall was coming down. So my, my lecture series was titled, Einreich, Einvoke, Einführer. And boy, did people jump out windows. I mean, it's the most amazing thing. Because it was true. We were going to reunite Germany. We, we, that, that we were going to bring Europe together 
and bring down the Berlin Wall. And Hitler was never a leader. In fact, he was a bum. And that that really the really the leader for Europe was LaRouche and what we had done. And it's true, we brought down that Berlin Wall. And that shame that that freed Eastern Europe, which we have as in the response by Glaziev on Lynn's hundredth anniversary, where he points out that yeah, LaRouche was right. That's it. I mean, Glaziev has precisely what LaRouche did. He freed Eastern Europe. And right now, relative to anything else in the world, the one country that's Christian is Russia. All the other countries are for shit compared to Russia. Not that Russia's perfect by any means, but but, but relatively speaking, and as far as I can tell, they have almost a perfect leadership at this point. They've done nothing but but to sharpen the military capabilities of Russia to no good. I mean, they're unbelievably good. I mean, it's McGregor and and even um, Scott Ritter even says this. You know, that basically they're almost unstoppable at this point, and they're not going to. Tr they won't deal with. The, they don't want to deal with the problems of Poland and Romania, or even Germany. <laughs> At this point, that's the last thing in the world they want to do. They're not too interested in the transgenders either. I mean, that, it's the most amazing thing. So the issue here is that what Dr. Moon was actually working on is by understanding this the business with the space-time lattice, lattice and the antimatter and the neutrinos, we can get a core, a key to extending human lifespans a thousand years. Primarily, that will be by regulating the neural transmitters, which Dr. Moon discovered with his CAT scan. And um, that by tuning the transmitters, we can re reignite the ATP cycle in the cells. And that is to turn off the fermenting that's going on right now with aging and turn it back to where they're young again in a certain sense with the ATP cycle going and thus get about a thousand year lifespan, which would be useful because if you have scientists let who right now, scientists die too early. We want scientists who live hundreds of years because it takes that much time to actually do something new and worthwhile then we might be able to make progress on that lifespan. And that's the reason they killed Dr. Moon. That's what he was going for in 1989. We were zeroing in on how to extend human lifespans to a thousand years. Two things on Dr. Moon. You you just used the words Dr. Moon's CAT, sta CAT scan. Are you saying that he had a role to play in the development of the CAT scan? Or are you saying something? Well, he, his doctoral dissertation was on the CAT scan. This was a diversion from his original work on fusion. He was originally going to work on nuclear fusion as developed by Harkins in 1915. But he got diverted to the Manhattan Project building the Chicago Cyclotron. But for his doctoral dissertation, he came up with the with basically the science for the CAT scan. He couldn't get anyone to build it here in the U.S., so he had to go over to England, EMI, and they built the first CAT scan. There is there is papers relating him to it. He never took out patents himself. Um, <laughs> he didn't believe in that. But anyway. The except as part of the Manhattan Project, he had to take some patents out. But the the th thing was, yes, he developed the CAT scan, and um, he had a lot of backing on his work. Ha the chief scientist for Howard Hughes was Dr. Robert James Moon, the person he flew on the Spruce Goose. The Spruce Goose was originally designed to become a nuclear-powered plane. That's why it's made out of balsa wood, because anything else you, you get 
activity from d- neutrons. They had a nuclear reactor on the Spruce Goose, but it didn't power the Spruce Goose. They just brought it on to see they could carry that weight. Wow. Wow. And now, how I got confirmation of this was in 1983, in November, Dr. Moon, I, and, 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 and Malloy Vaughn uh, met with the vice president of Lockheed Martin in Colorado. We were doing that for the National Security Council to discuss the deployment of X-ray lasers. Colonel Vaughn, who's sort of a specialist from the Pentagon who worked with LaRouche, and uh, Malloy, Robert Malloy, the vice president from Lockheed, began the discussion by talking about what they had done previously. All three, Dr. Moon, Malloy, and Vaughn, had all worked on the nuclear plane. That's when Dr. Moon revealed that he had worked with Howard Hughes. When I came back to Washington and explained this to Ray Pollack at the National Security Council, Ray said I was crazy. Then Ray went through a whole list of crazy things he'd worked on before, like cracking the Earth's crust and all sorts of things. But I said, Ray, they didn't know each other. How is it they all came up with the same story? You should go check it out. So about a month later, Ray comes back and says, I checked it out. It was above my security clearance. He was running the SDI for Reagan. (laughs) Now, and he had spent 20 years at Los Alamos. So after that's when he accepted the, the, the moon's work on the coal fusion and he set up a coal fusion program. That was, that was, that was uh, sabotaged directly by Hans Beta. I know I was talking to Beta at the time. Beta literally said that Harkins is worse than coal fusion. <laughs> Because he had been fighting Harkin, Hawkins his whole life. And it actually suppressed um, Hawkins' papers, Harkins' papers on the compound nucleus and on nuclear fission work and so forth back in the 30s. That is, Harkins came up with the neutron in 1920. Harkins' work led directly to the nuclear fission. In fact, in 1932, Harkins gave a national radio broadcast detailing we now have nuclear energy in hand because of the discovery of the actual neutron that he had forecast in 1920. And he proceeded to, to, to launch it with the Chicago psychotron that led directly to the Chicago pile, which was built by Moon and other Harkin students who actually built the pile in Chicago. And they went out and they built Hanford and so forth. But all of this had been been diverted by the by the British, Mm. by the um, the whole thing you're going into with H.G. Wells and so forth. That's true. That whole thing was a diversion. Teller went through in great detail in 1987 how he he had been sabotaged by J. Robert Oppenheimer. Moon's group at Chicago came up with a letter that they circulated against dropping the bombs on cities in Japan. They're called concerned scientists. Moon and his friends sent the letter to Teller. Teller was going to circulate it at Los Alamos, but Oppenheimer said, no, you can't do that because you don't know Japan and what's going on with that. You have to leave this in the hands of the generals and diplomats who know something. Well, it turns out he lied. That Oppenheimer himself pushed the idea of dropping the bombs. And the people in Washington weren't for it. It was Oppenheimer who was for dropping the bombs. So as far as Teller's concerned, that is a holocaust. That is genocide. Because it's it's well known to Teller that it would have been far more effective if what the U.S. did was to set off a nuclear bomb above Tokyo Harbor 
about 20 miles up. Everyone in Japan would see it, but no one would be hurt. It would not hurt a soul. Mm. And it would have ended the war quicker. Right. But that's what they were absolutely opposed to. They had to, they had to kill hundreds of thousands of people to teach the Russians and the black and yellow people a lesson. <laughs> So, which was worse than genocide, because what it was was setting up world rule, so to speak, as became quite evident in Bertrand Russell's 1946 paper on nuclear war in the Bulletin of Atomic Sciences. Quick question on Harkins. Uh, it's sort of like a Jerry Jerry type question, kind of on the new on the the neutron. Um, I know in Harkins. Uh, 1920 paper, he was thinking about the neutron from the standpoint of an internucleic uh, electron. Um, is that Well, no, no. The idea was virtual neutrons. That is, you want to condense an electron onto a proton. Yeah. This is what Moon wanted to do in his experiments yeah. in, the, in, the, in the 30s. And actually, people have succeeded. If you look at Larson's work, there's a lot of other work that around this cold fusion stuff where what goes on is instead of having nuclear fusion, what you do is you produce these virtual neutrons, which transmute the heavier elements. Right. Right. And a guy by the name of Larson and some of the people I'm working with at the Naval proceedings <laughs> who worked a little bit on this though. I, I'm not sure exactly what side they're on, but anyway, the, the, um, the, uh, Point is, and in fact, I've circulated the books on that. There was, I think, three books done on this uh, question of the virtual neutrons and cold fusion and so forth. I'll send them to you again. Please. Cool. Um, okay, I'm just trying to think here. We got Mike. Mike, did you still have a, uh, a follow up? Oh my gosh, I couldn't begin to try to ask as many questions <laughs> as this guy has. Like, I know a right hemisphere thinker when I see one. Um, okay. You know a what? Uh, the right hand. You're, pro oh, you're right probably right. not familiar I don't with know uh, I'm right or not. Ian McGrocris' work um, of right hemisphere Ooh. proclivity of thought versus left hemisphere proclivity no, of thought. No. I'm, a, I'm an avid studier of this line of no, thinking. No, I'm not familiar with that one. Yeah, no, no, fair enough. But you're, 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 you're demonstrating the signature regardless of whether you understand it or not. This is the beautiful thing about physics. What? It applies to you whether you believe it or not. So. Well, that's true. Be, this being said, um, when, when we're starting to get into it, because there's a, there's a nuclear um, signature of harmonics and there is a plasma signature of harmonics. If um, mm -hmm. my studies are leading me in what I believe is a um, Keplerian directive. So mm -hmm. do you, would you consider that perhaps our understanding of gravitational constant is actually subservient to harmonic constant? Well, I mean, now the, the guy to look to uh, there is, uh, in fact, um, Benny Saldano wrote a few papers on this, on the unification of, of science, on the unification of physics. Uh, he actually wrote a whole book on it. But he, he mentions the work of, of Patrick Blackett. Are you familiar with Blackett? In fact, I mean, in a certain sense, I think it was one of the first people to actually experimentally demonstrate the existence of, of antimatter. Anyway, Blackett, um, who some of the people I work with are sort of descendants of Blackett, like Steve Craxton, who listened to Lynn on tuning, Belcano tuning of the lasers and came up with a Belcano tuned laser the femtosecond laser that did what Lynn said in terms of machining and so forth. Uh, and Steve actually is the one who had them mention Harkin's work on fusion in this latest paper on laser fusion, which is the first time that's happened in a hundred years. But anyway, the thing is that
Remind me what you're asking that because I, I really blocked out exactly the key. Uh, no, no. Thing. Okay. So, so there, there's, there's papers that have been released on plasma resonance and mm -hmm. nuclear, nuclear resonance. So this, this basically offers the concept that instead of gravity being a constant for manipulation yeah. of plasma and nuclear, actually a harmonics plays a resonance uh, frequency. Yeah. Oh, this, for, this this is Blackett's point on 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 the gravity that he tried to account for gravity from rotation of the of 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 the Earth's core involving this generation of the magnetic poles. Now it turns out the connection between all three. Wells was inspired by Lynn to apply his theory to the formation of the solar system. In that, he had not looked at it before. When Wells applied his Beltrami plas or self-organized plasma physics to the formation of the solar system, he got everything. He got the placement of the planets, he got their velocities, and he even got their magnetic fields which was an amazing thing. But the point is that goes all the way back to Blackett's looking at a unified field and where you could account for gravity on the basis of the rotation of the cores. Okay. Now and, that, and that's, that's, not, that's not a perfect sphere, right? That rotation, that's not a perfect sphere then. That, that's an ellipsis, know. right? I, I, oh, okay. That, fair enough. Fair I, enough. I don't know. I, I, that's a very good question. But anyway, the point is, but that that you do have a coherence between the microphysics and the macrophysics, and that's the area where they go bird. They 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 they, they literally go crazy. That's where they're very upset at Larouche, because Larouche went after that with a vengeance demonstrating the coherence between what is otherwise called macrophysics and the microphysics involving the tuning. This is what develops in this whole question of music and the well-tempered scale. And uh, my breakthroughs, a lot of my breakthroughs on the physics came from talking to musicians about actually what went on. And the, we had some of the greatest musicians in the world working with us. In fact, the greatest cello player, Carlo Levi Minzi on the piano. Uh, we had an amazing situation where we used to mix all these together with the physicists. And this was, this led to all sorts of discussions. But the um, fact is that that's the area where they've come down the hardest on LaRouche. That is, they did not like the C-256. They did not like our work on music. And there were agents internal to the organization who went all out to suppress this work. For example, uh, a, a guy by the name of David Goldman, hmm. who's right now in Hong Kong. Uh, Goldman is working with... Um, with uh, Uva Parpart and um, and uh, Jonathan Tenenbaum. Is this the same Goldman that also proposed the? Um, he also actually kind of complimented the abiotic oil theory that our Earth through harmonic. I don't know. Are... I don't know. Okay. No. Fair enough. Fair enough. No, okay. no, no. This Goldman is is in economics and politics. And he, he was an editor of EIR for a while, too. But they're all working with a guy by the name of uh, Stephen Schmalley, S-M-A-L-E, former head of the mathematics department at the University of California, Berkeley. Who was credited with with organizing a thing called the New Left in 1965. Do you have time for one more question? Oh, sure. I have time for unending questions. 
Careful what you uh you offer, man. You might get taken. Why I know I <laughs> Uh, all right, we got uh, Makos, who's asking here in the chat, uh, regarding Cold Fusion, what was the role of Pons and Fleischmann's work in the 90s? That was a question I was also, it was in the back of my mind, too. Did they make real breakthroughs? Were they suppressed? What's what's the story with Pons and Fleischmann? Yeah. Okay. Well, I know the whole story. The, the thing was... Um, Pons and Fleischmann were, were deployed as a black box program by Ray Pollock out of the National Security Council. Now, and I know it would be hard to do. So they set up a black box program where they would not have to report anything until they had five years of experiments behind them. What happened, though, was that again, they virtual neutrons. And the minute they got the neutrons, they had reported that to the Department of Energy because of the radiation has Neutrons are very hazardous in radiation because their neutron has almost an infinite chemical potential. So even a small number of neutrons can cause cancer and all sorts of problems. So it's the law. You have to report that to the Department of Energy. So they reported the result of their experiment getting neutrons or something like neutrons. The Department of Energy then deployed Hans Beta as a scientist to check the safety on the program. Hans brought in a saboteur from Idaho who immediately proceeded to try to duplicate their experiments in another facility and therefore forcing them to publish too early. That was all coordinated by Hans Beta. Then Beta moved the first team in of the, of the, of the, uh, the first team, so to speak, of, of our friend um, Bertram Russell, uh, of physicists to come in and sabotage the whole thing by supposedly doing experiments, proving it never happened and so forth. So the whole operation was run by Hans Beta in terms of sabotaging. Now, I later found out that Fleischmann was already around the Fusion Energy Foundation, especially on the music area. So he's an interesting character. Pons, I don't know that much about. But the fact is, uh, and they scared the shit out of poor Ray Pollock. That, <laughs> poor Ray. He didn't, know, he didn't know what he was working with. I mean, Ray was never someone who was politically or philosophically associated with us. Ray, in 1979, was deployed by the, by the director of Los Alamos National Lab to be an advisor to us on our beam weapons stuff in that Ray was one of the leading experts on ballistic missile defense at Los Alamos. And Ray came in on that basis. I mean, in other words, he was not at all politically around LaRouche or philosophically and so forth. But... Another scientist at Los Alamos had a wife who has an EIR subscription, Leslie McCall. And Leslie knew them all. And Leslie told me that Ray Pollock is the chief enemy, chief opponent of George A. Keyworth, the guy they deployed into the White House as science advisor. So I knew Keyworth was an enemy brought in to sabotage the whole thing. And I knew that 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 the kryptonite against Keyworth was Pollock, who had been fighting Pollock for decades at Los Alamos. So I had an inside story. So we, we got Pollock to become the chief scientist at the National Security Council. The head of the National Security Council was meeting with LaRouche, and he, he asked LaRouche, do you know someone whose credentials we could bring in? And we said, yeah, Ray Pollock, bring him in. And he did. And I moved from, I, before that, 19, from 1978 to 1982, I was on the street handing out leaflets about the need for a beam weapon program in front of the White House. We would do that regularly and talk to people. In 1982, Ray moved into the National Security Council, and I did too. So I went inside the building I had been out before. <laughs> So I went from the outside to the end.
Chuck. Yes. I got I got so many other questions that I'd, I'd want to ask you. And unfortunately, time has has running a little bit thin on our end. We have uh, to wind it down. So I'm going to throw out the offer one last time because I know I, I can pick up the phone and call you anytime I want. So I'm going to withhold. But does anybody have a last question that they want to get out of their mind? Because now would be the time to do it. If you do, if you've been holding back. All right. I feel like I'm sort of mining the zeitgeist, looking for high quality ideas. And I really struck gold, my man, with uh, with the mind of Chuck Stevens. So there's really a lot of pay dirt there. I really appreciate you you being so generous, sharing your experiences, your discoveries, your insight with all of us. And I'm looking forward to more future collaboration. I, I really, really do appreciate you having taken this time and being willing to do this again in the future. So thank you, Chuck. And thank you, everybody, for uh, joining thank us you. on this edifying Sunday afternoon. Thank you all. Yeah, I concur, man. I could probe your mind for quite a while. I, I'm your Huckleberry, man. You guys ever want to play this game again? I want to dance with this guy. <laughs> Did you post your, post your Facebook or contact information? Yeah, what I'm gonna do, yes. I'm gonna get the, I'm gonna get this uploaded online, and I'm gonna have a ton of links in the description box, which will include Chuck's uh, right. Facebook info. You, you you have my, my telephone number and you have my email address, so post those. I have no problem people calling me or really? emailing me. I'll send your I'll put your email address. Okay, I telephone that could be I'll, okay. I'll okay, I'll, well, I'll, well, I'll, well, so. okay, <laughs> good. All right, and, um, oh wait, yep, yep. Okay, and, and the Facebook is very simple. It's Facebook Charles Stevens, 1848. There we go. Just think of Revolution, 1848. 1848 Revolution. Okay. <laughs> All right, cool. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Okay, take care.